Hello, and welcome to the story of, sorry, the true story of a dog's heroic struggle to return to the family that he loves. A quick little note about the author here, it's uh, just a quick little, little read, but it's written by Kyra Petrovskaya Wayne. A um, little bit of about her, she's the daughter of a Russian prince. Uh, that grew up in the Soviet Union, um, and during World War II, she actually saw combat as a rifle-carrying sharpshooter and worked in the field as a nurse. Um, sadly, she was caught in the city of Leningrad, one of, if not the most, deadliest sieges of all human history. But she survived. Some people think up to one million people died in that city, some, the low estimates are 800,000, I believe. And even on the low end, the amount of people that lost their lives in that city of, uh, city of Leningrad were more than the U.S. and U.K.'s combined deaths throughout the entirety of World War II. So it gives you a little bit of a perspective of maybe why someone like this would find themselves drawn to a story about a dog named Max. Max, the dog that refused to die. And just to begin here, we'll start off with a little foreword. I think a lot of you might know who this is, actually. Every now and then, one runs across a tale of a great animal courage and wisdom. The animal lover within us smiles and nods, but we are not too surprised, because that's why we love them, for they are brave and wise. However, the true story of Max transcends any in my experience. His indomitable will to live and his refusal again and again to accept defeat and through it all in his unfathering, unfaltering faith in humans must reach all of us in many different ways. Max came back and paid his dues by opening some doors for some troubled people. However, it doesn't stop there. He will linger with many of us for all time to bark a soft echo of encouragement when times are rough. I am proud to know him. Stage, screen, and television star trustee of the Morris Animal Foundation and the National Canine Vice President, Betty White. In the car, George commanded. Our two Dobermans immediately jumped into the back of the station wagon, behind a special grate separating the passenger section from the dog's own compartment. Max, the eldest of the two, his beautiful black coat shining like satin, settled down on the foam mattress at once. He knew from experience that a long trip was ahead of him, and he watched us playing suitcases, placing suitcases in the car and knew that it meant a vacation. All during the loading of the car, he was nervous, afraid that he might be left behind, but now he could relax and take it easy. He was certain that he was going too. Hildy, the seventh-month-old, chocolate-brown female, was too excited to settle down. She playfully bit Max's ear, but he didn't even growl. He just shook his head, rattling his tags, and stuck his nose between his great big paws. He knew that she would settle down soon, and he saw that I had thoughtfully provided Hildy with a hard ball to chew on. Soon she would start on the ball, and then bored and pacified by the rhythmic sound of the wheels and the smooth movement of the car, she too would fall asleep. George and I were looking forward to this little trip. He had actually never been to the Sequoia National Park. in the high sierras and it was years since i had been there besides we had two guests visiting us two brothers from mexico city carlos and francisco age 12 and 8 respectively they were the sons of one of our best friends an attorney it seemed to us that the boys would enjoy a trip to the high sierras they had been to disneyland and the movie studios and we thought that a trip to the mountains would be really exciting for the two young city boys we started early off in the morning, 
having arranged to spend the night in a motel in Three Rivers, a small community in the foothills, planning to drive in the mountains early the following morning, the best time to enter the National Forest. It was a pleasant drive, leaving crowded Los Angeles, the freeway normally congested, was really a freeway at this hour. For thousands of cars were moving toward the city, bringing thousands of people to work, while very few cars were on their way out. In eight hours the flow would be reversed, but by that time we would be 250 miles away in the quiet hamlet of Three Rivers. Do you suppose there will actually be Three Rivers? Carlos asked. I'd like to see Three Rivers all at the same time. Me too, cried the eight-year-old Francisco. He always agreed with what his older brother said. We'll be lucky if we even find one, I replied. The way we have less and less rain each winter, I won't be surprised if soon there aren't any rivers left in Southern California. It will be nice if there is a real river, George remarked dreamily. We'll go for a walk along the banks. Immediately, the familiar phrase, go for a walk, had a galvanizing effect on the dogs. They lifted their heads their intelligent eyes sparkling, their sharp white teeth gleaming as eager smiles, appeared on their elongated faces. Max barked one short affirmative bark, which he always did when asked, do you want to go for a walk? And we laughed. Boy, do they know those words, George exclaimed. Imagine they were fast asleep, and yet they heard us. Not yet, George told the dogs, as he watched them in his rearview rear mirror. <clears throat> Now go to sleep. Obediently, Max dropped his head on the paws again, sighed deeply, and closed his eyes. Hildy stood up, turned around several times as if performing a ritual dog dance, and then stretched out next to Maxie and went to sleep. We drove along, passing small agricultural communities along the way. We stopped several times for a cup of coffee and then for lunch, letting the dogs out for a short walk on their leashes. We weren't in a hurry at all. It was a lovely blue and golden day, perfect California day, becoming more perfect with every minute that we drew, drove farther and farther away from that smoggy city. My husband, a doctor of psychiatry, began to sing. George was free for a few days, free of the hospital, free of patients, free to enjoy the mountains and the magnificent, magnificent, magnificent sequoia trees. Teach us some Mexican songs, he said to the boys. Do you know Lindo? asked Carlos. How does it go? A, 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 sang Francisco in a clear, high soprano. Oh, yes, I know that one, explained my husband, as he joined the boys in a lusty randism of a popular song. I know it in Russian, I said. Sing it, the boys begged. So I joined them in singing the Russian version of the Lil Ting song. Let's sing it in three languages at the same time, Francisco cried with enthusiasm, so we all did, laughing at the total confusion. The dogs lifted their head at the sound of our singing, but hearing no familiar words, sighed contently and resumed their napping. George turned off the air conditioning and we opened the windows. The wind rushed into the car, rustling among the plastic bags containing our clothes and rocking them on their wire hangers. We drove along miles of orange groves and apple orchards in bloom, the aroma of blossoms wafting into the car. We were off the main road by now and were driving toward Portville and Lindsay, two small towns in the foothills of the High Sierras. And to think that all this was once nothing but desert, said George. Did you know how they planted these groves? They all have irrigation, irrigation ditches between the rows of the trees. Their water bill must be enormous. We found our motel in Three Rivers very pleasing. Our two rooms were at the back of the building facing the fast-moving river beyond a stretch of sandy shore, strewn by huge boulders and smooth river stones. During the rainy season, the shore must have been inundated by rushing waters, but now, late in May, the river had receded and become a rather shallow, shallow though swift stream. The boys and the dogs joyfully leaped out of the car. Jumping from stone to stone, they reached the stream in no time. The, dirgs, the dogs thirstily began to lap up the icy water, rushing down from the peaks of the Sierras. The dogs thirstily began to lap up the icy water, rushing down from the peaks of the Sierras. 
Hildy waded into the water, barking foolishly and exuberantly at the little rivulets gathering around and then quickly dissipating around her legs. She tried to catch them in their mouth, but couldn't understand why all she could taste was water. Max, the wise old boy of almost three years of age, just stood on the flat rock watching his mate. He didn't like to get his feet wet and cold. He knew better than to try and catch a wave. All one would get was a nose full of water. He had tried it once or twice when he was Hildy's age. He was with us one of our trips to the mountains a couple of years ago. It was very early in the spring, and the ground around Lake Arrowhead was still covered with snow. Max eloped happily ahead of us, joyfully biting mouthfuls of snow here and there. And suddenly he saw a flock of ducks swimming near the landing, and without hesitation he leaped off to the pier into the icy lake. The ducks, quacking in loud excitement, scattered in all directions, leaving Maxie thrashing wildly in the water. He made his way back to the pier, feeling very, very foolish. We helped him climb up. He shook himself vigorously, sending a cascade of fine spray in all directions. The ducks regrouped and, feeling no threat, swam even closer to the pier, quacking as if taunting the unfortunate Max. He ignored them. Instead, he put on an exhibition of misery for our benefit. He trembled and lifted one paw, then another, demonstrating how cold it was to stand with wet feet on the frozen ground. We took pity on our would-be hunter. Okay, George said, let's go back to the car. Hearing his beloved word car, Maxie forgot his discomforts and dashed ahead of us to the parking lot. He knew exactly where the car was, and he waited there, barking to hurry us on. I used paper napkins to dry Max as best as I could, but he continued to shiver, and with a sigh, George took off his own sweater and put it on Max. Willingly, Max allowed me to pull his front paws through the sleeves as he sat on the front seat between us, still trembling, but quite content. Don't you think he looks rather dashing in this red turtleneck, George asked, glancing at our noble hound. Who knows what went through Max's mind, but whatever since that time, he really has hated water. He watched Hildy now as she raced back and forth in the shallows of the stream, feeling too smart for such nonsense himself. Besides, his stomach reminded him that it was time for dinner. Max knew that five o'clock each evening was the best time of the day, eating time. He looked at George, who was unloading the car, then at me. He gave me his paw and barked. What do you want? I asked. Pretending that I did not know, he barked again just once, but it had an urgent sound to it. Are you hungry? Max barked again, eagerly this time. For he knew that I understood him and responded with just the right words. I glanced at my watch, right on the dot. George, the dogs are hungry, I yelled to my husband, and there stood George at the door to our rooms, smiling, two dishes of dog food in his hands. Ready, he replied. Dinner is served. Maxie and Hildy did not need another invitation. Boy, are they smart, exclaimed Carlos. How did you train them? Uh, we talked to them as if they were children. They're smarter than children, cried little Francesco. Sure, they are smarter than you, loco, laughed his brother, giving him an affectionate poke in the ribs. The little fellow did not mind. He knew that his big brother didn't mean it. We watched them as they poked at one another, talking in rapid Spanish, calling each other names and laughing. The next morning, we were on our way to the mountains. We skipped breakfast, planning to have it at the lodge in the village, but the dogs, of course, had their feeding. Hildy was still a puppy and needed at least three meals a day, while Maxie played on our sympathy by pretending that he was starved, or that he, too, was a whimpering, endearing puppy. Sometimes he would simply blackmail us by doing his tricks, knowing that we would not leave his efforts unrewarded. His tricks included giving his paw, bringing his toys one by one, and barking on command. He could also sit, come closer, and by easing himself forward towards a person without leaving the stiff, attentive si uh, sitting position, instead he would slide on his behind nearer and nearer until his head would touch the person's knees. But his most spectacular attention getters were speaking and shaking hands in foreign languages. Maxie understood and obeyed, obeyed these commands in five languages. English, French, Italian, German, and Russian. 
When we left on vacation, he was learning his sixth Spanish, which Carlos and Francisco were teaching him. It took us a long time to reach the village of the giant trees, but we were not in a hurry. We enjoyed the gradual change of scenery from the clusters of deciduous trees in the foothills, with their bright green young leaves just beginning to unfold, to the darker hues of old hemlocks and cedars as we proceeded higher and higher along the winding road toward the summit. Once in a while, we would spot a tall sequoia tree, a harbinger of the groves, which we were soon to see. We stopped several times to admire the view, to marvel at the beauty of the mountains, the depth of the canyons and the gorges, and the crystal purity of the waterfalls cascading from the mountains in ever-changing, lacy patterns of splashing waters. The mist around the falls reflected the sun, and a colorful rainbow spanned the falls and the mountain top like a magic bridge. When I was a child, I would always, I had always wanted to climb such a bridge, believing in uh, my omnipotence. George began to sing Over the Rainbow with all of us joining him again. We passed through an open sunlit meadow and saw several deer grazing peacefully almost at the road's edge. Hildy immediately began to bark. Her shrill, still undeveloped yelps startled the deer and they ran off into the forest. She always takes herself too seriously, says Carlos. She thinks that because she's a guard dog and goes to obedience school, she's on duty all the time. She will learn. Max will teach her. Max never barks without reason. In fact, he never does anything without a good reason, George replied. True, Maxie always knew when to bark and how to knock on a closed door and be admitted into a room. He even learned to open a door by turning the knob with his teeth. He never chased cats at our country house where we perpetually have crops of kittens. No, on the contrary, he played with the kittens and allowed them to crawl over them, crawl all over him, licking them with his warm pink tongue until they would become soaking wet. Hildy, on the other hand, could not stand a cat, and would chase it up the tree or onto the roof, barking furiously and preventing the frightened animal from descending from its perch. Like two children from the same family sharing the same love and attention but displaying completely different personalities, our dogs were distinct individuals. Hildy, a cocky, arrogant scrapper ready for a fight, and Maxie, an intelligent, dignified guard dog who knew when to bark and when to remain silent, when to show his vicious-looking teeth in a threatening way, and when to smile. Higher and higher we drove, following the hairpin turns that reminded us of the, nor of the North Road in Nikko, Japan, where we had visited a few years ago. Here and there we saw clusters of dogwood in full bloom, the large, white, delicate, waxy-looking flower, providing pleasant relief from the dark green colors of the ancient forest. We stopped at an observation point to look over the railing. Thousands of feet below at the bottom of a deep canyon, we could see the narrow ribbon of a silvery river. Above us, reaching into the deep blue sky, were the high Sierras, monolithic and majestic, covered with tall stands of pine and oak, hemlock and cedar. And still higher up, we saw huge bare rocks covered with sparkling white snow. The high Sierras were absolutely magnificent. We drank from a water fountain, and the dogs joined us by standing on their hind legs and adroitly catching the jets of water aimed at their mouths. Even young Hildy was able to drink this way, Max being an old hand at civilized methods as such. Up and down we drove until at last we arrived at the lodge. We planned to stay in the forest until dark, then spend the night at our motel in Three Rivers, and then be on our way the following morning. Being a Friday, it would have allowed us to reach the city in good time, long before the multitudes of people would be returning along the same freeway on Saturday or Sunday. Through long experience of traveling along California highways, we had learned when not to attempt to return to the city. We had breakfast at the park cafeteria while the dogs waited patiently in the back of the car. It was still chilly when we started walking along the trail leading into the forest. The boys ran ahead, yelling and shouting, waiting for their echo as their voices bounced off the craggy cliffs surrounding the narrow trail. The dogs strained at their leashes, eager to run, all the way after the boys. 
Max and Hildy were accustomed to running freely whenever we walked them in the mountains of San Bernardino National Forest, where we had our country home. They never strayed far, always returning to us at the first signal from the whistle that my husband wore around his neck. And for a couple of miles, we led the dogs on their leashes. It was a difficult task with two large Dobermans on a narrow path. Finally, though, George suggested that we let the dogs run. Maybe we'd better not, I protested mildly. They've never been here before. Ah, they'll be all right. They're used to being in the mountains. There's no place for them to get hurt, no traffic, nothing. George unleashed Maxie, who darted along the path like a bullet. I couldn't control Hildy. She went wild trying to catch up with Maxie. I unhooked her leash and she was gone. They passed the boys, not even bothering to answer the invitation to play. Vanishing as if swallowed by the forest. Almost at once, George and I grew uneasy. It happened often that we had the same feelings simultaneously. We wouldn't have to say a word, but we both knew what we thought or what we had to do. This time was no exception. We felt that the dogs must be called back. We felt that something serious had happened, and without even exchanging a word, we began calling the dogs. George blew his whistle, and I yelled in a special, high, shrill, penetrating voice, reserved just for this purpose. Maxie! Hildy! Here, dogs! We heard a crash among the ferns, and Hildy dashed into the path, her wet tongue hanging down like a swath of pink velvet. Where's Maxie? I asked. As I attached the leash to her collar, she hyperventilated and did not make a move of protest against her leash. George blew his whistle again. We stopped on the path, hoping momentarily to hear the sounds of Max running through the bush. Maxie, the boys called. Come back, Maxie. It was dark on the narrow path, the tall trees glowing, growing closer together on each side and twined their branches over the path creating the impression that we were inside a cool, fragrant tunnel. There was very little direct sunlight on the path for the suns raised to penetrate many layers of heavy fawns of old hemlocks and cedars. The path itself was wet. It was still covered with frost and was just beginning to thaw. Maxie! Yoo-hoo! Maxie! Nothing. Not a fern moved. Hildy whimpered and I patted her. George blew his whistle in a combination of sounds that never failed to bring Maxie prancing back. But still... Nothing. I think that's where we will end off the first little part of the story here. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. If you guys have any pointers, you know, maybe if I need to talk louder, talk quieter... You know, change up anything, let me know. But hopefully you enjoyed part number one of Max, the dog that refused to die. Stay tuned to hear Max's point of view for the rest of the story, basically. There's just a little bit more of the owner's point of view, and then from Max's point of view, we will see how and what he went through.